there was fear. The, the, I remember when it got close to the first day we were going to enter, you know, it was, it was fearful. So many more kids in the classrooms than here. I was sort of nervous. This way it was. Uh, they never really talk about Martinsburg High School or Bursary School or why you was not going there. Well, we knew we were black. You learn this when you're able to talk. I used to cry a lot like then. We're seeing ugliness and racism rear its head again. This did happen, and it is still happening. Prior to the Civil War, almost all enslaved African-American children were unable to attend school. Prohibitions that made the education of enslaved children illegal date back to legislation passed in South Carolina in 1740. Virginia also passed such a statute in 1831. Throughout the slave era, few African-Americans were literate. In the mid-19th century, civil rights pioneer Frederick Douglass believed that there was indeed a connection between literacy and liberation. As a child, he taught himself to read and write after an owner's wife taught him the alphabet. He realized that once you learn to read, you will be forever free. Slave owners believed education was a threat to slavery. However, even before the Civil War, formal education of a small number of African Americans began many times to convert supposed heathen Africans to Christianity. Additionally, abolitionists sponsored efforts to prepare African Americans to live as free people. As early as 1745, the Quakers were leaders in such endeavors and initiated elementary schools for them in non-slave states. After the Civil War, Schools were built for colored children in former slave states. Though slavery ended, the schools being built were segregated. Many of these early segregated schools were named after Charles Sumner, a white senator from Massachusetts. Senator Sumner graduated from Harvard Law School in 1833 and served in the United States Senate from 1852 until after the Civil War. Sumner demonstrated an outspoken support for the abolition of slavery during a time when speaking up for the rights of emancipated African Americans almost cost him his life. After Sumner delivered a fiery anti-slavery speech on the Senate floor in 1856, Representative Preston Brooks of South Carolina attacked Sumner with a heavy walking stick until he was left bleeding and unconscious on the chamber floor. Still, Sumner continued to advocate for the abolition of slavery. To honor him, many black schools were named after Sumner. In 1872, Charles Sumner School opened in Washington, D.C. There is a museum there now. Sumner High School also opened in downtown St. Louis in 1875. It was the first African-American school west of the Mississippi. West Virginia can claim a pioneering first. In 1862, during the Civil War and before West Virginia was a state, the Sumner School in Parkersburg became the first free school for African-American children south of the Mason-Dixon line. Local lore holds that Barbara Robert W. Simmons, a leader of the African-American community, traveled to Washington to request Abraham Lincoln's support for the school. Its board set a $1 per month tuition fee and made provisions to accept children who could not afford to pay. The school became a part of the segregated public school system in 1866. It graduated its first high school class of four students in 1887. Following the end of the Civil War, attempts began in earnest to educate newly freed African Americans. In 1865, the Free Will Baptist Society for Maine established a mission school in Martinsburg and other places in the Eastern Panhandle. This first school for African Americans in Berkeley County, West Virginia, was a one-room log cabin on what was known as Welch Street, off of what is now called Race Street. Children attended the school during the day and adults attended at night. One of the first teachers was Annie Dudley from Maine. Missionaries also conducted religious revivals seeking to instill Christian values along what was known as the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. 
In 1867, Berkeley County's Board of Education purchased a lot that was 50 feet by 90 feet on West Martin Street for $112. This two-room, one-story brick building, the first brick schoolhouse in Martinsburg, was built on that site. Significantly, the bricks were brought from the old arsenal at Harper's Ferry, which was destroyed during the Civil War. The arsenal was a site of John Brown's raid, which he had hoped would spark a slave revolt. Also in 1867, Free Will Baptists from Maine founded Storer College in Harper's Ferry to educate African Americans. One of the most distinguished early graduates was J.R. Clifford, one of West Virginia's most famous African Americans. He was born in 1848 in present-day Moorfield, West Virginia. Clifford, who served in the Union Army during the Civil War, graduated from Storer College in 1875 with a teaching degree. He became a teacher and eventually principal at the Sumner School in Martinsburg. Under his leadership, the school grew, and Abram Bex was added as his assistant. Mrs. J.R. Clifford and Mr. John W. Corsi were also soon added to the Sumner School faculty. Between 1879 and 1886, J.R. Clifford and John W. Corsi were rivals for the principal's jobs and alternated in this position according to the political complexion of the Board of Education. John Corsi became principal after Clifford left Sumner in 1886 and continued to serve intermittently until 1891, followed by W.B. Evans until 1895, when Corsi returned once again as principal. In 1887, a year after Clifford left Sumner to pursue other interests, he became the first African American admitted to practice law in West Virginia. In 1898, he litigated a pioneering case, Williams v. Board of Education, before the Supreme Court of Appeals of West Virginia. The Tucker County Board of Education had shortened the school year for African American students only from nine to five months. Nevertheless, Tucker County teacher Carrie Williams continued to teach classes for African American students for the full school year. As a result, she was not paid for her work, and Clifford filed the lawsuit for her back pay. The court ruled in Williams' favor, holding that African-American and white students should have the same school year. Although it would take another 56 years for the U.S. Supreme Court to integrate schools, the Williams case forced West Virginia schools to uphold the equal part of the separate but equal principle upon which American segregation rested. In addition to his legal career in 1882, Clifford established the Pioneer Press, Martinsburg's first African-American newspaper. In 1906, he also helped organize the second national meeting of the Niagara Movement, which had been founded the year before by W.E.B. Du Bois. This meeting was held at Storer College. The Niagara Movement became the foundation for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. Mr. Fred R. Raymer, who graduated from both Sumner School and then Stora College, became one of Sumner's only two teachers in 1889. He taught there for two years before leaving to accept a position as laborer in the United States Senate. While working for the Senate, he attended night school, graduating from Howard University in 1899 with a law degree. Raymer was presented his diploma by President McKinley. Then Mr. Raymer taught in the rural schools of Berkeley County for several years. He left teaching again to work as a clerk in the Norfolk Navy Yard and also for the U.S. Fish Commission. He then returned to teaching as an instructor in the first Sumner School for Colored Teachers at Institute, West Virginia. While teaching at Institute, he attended the University of Pittsburgh during the summer and took correspondence and extension courses before returning to the Sumner School in Martinsburg in 1897. Between 1897 and 1911, Corsi alternated as principal for the Sumner School with Raymer, according to their popularity with the Board of Education. Raymer was the longest serving continuous principal from 1911 to 1946. On June 17, 1899, the Sumner Colored School graduated five students who assembled at the Opera House to receive recognition for work well done before a host of applauding friends. By the early 20th century, many of the schools in Martinsburg were overcrowded. In 1907, Superintendent Brindle reported that 
The colored school is jammed to suffocation with pupils, with only one teacher alone having as many as 90 students in one room. If the compulsory education law was rigidly enforced, at least two and possibly three more rooms would be necessary to accommodate the colored children. But it took 10 years before anything was done about the overcrowding. The two-room original building, which had been expanded twice, served the colored population of Martinsburg until 1917, when a more modern eight-room brick building opened at 515 West Martin Street. The cost of the building was nearly $23,000. Fred Raymer was a primary force behind the construction of the new school. We had four sections where blacks live in Martinsburg. We had a section go from Martin Street to King Street, from Raleigh Street to Kentucky Avenue, from King Street over to Ray Street. It was like a circle. That's where the blacks lived. We was a family in the school. Outside of going to church, it was school. That's all we knew. That's what our family taught us. We grew up to be here at the school. And we couldn't go to any other schools. There was white schools within the same area, but we weren't allowed to go to any white schools. Uh, furthermore, if you go past those areas I just told you, at a certain time in the evening, the police would lock you up. Or else they'd come up and say, hey, boy, or ho hey, girl, what you doing out there? You better get on back up on the hill. And that's what they call this section. The school was very well known because the education was good. And the people respect each other. You didn't have to worry about your kid because if you got a spanking here, uh, before you get home, your parents gonna know it because you're gonna get a spanking there too. As far as we know, to get out of this area, uh, we needed this school. And that's what it really meant. It was the best thing ever happened, I know, to me. I loved the school. A formal dedication of the new Sumner School building occurred on March 22, 1918, and was attended by a large, integrated audience. The building was tastefully decorated with bunting and potted plants, old glory and pictures of Presidents Wilson, Washington and Lincoln were displayed, and music was furnished by the Martinsburg Cornet Band. Presiding over the ceremony was Board of Education President E.S. Barden and Superintendent W.C. Morton. The former pastor of Zion M.E. Church, the Reverend S.M. Bean, gave the principal address. He praised the zeal, stick to and bulldog tenacity displayed by Principal Raymer in building public sentiment for the school and imparting higher ideals to the community. The world being in turmoil because of World War I, Reverend Bean remarked that the Negroes were assisting in driving the Germans beyond the Rhine and making the whole world safe for democracy. With larger opportunities come larger responsibilities. We must instill patriotism in our youth he proclaimed in his address. Enrollment enjoyed a steady growth. For example, in 1917, the Sumner School had 139 students. In 1918, the enrollment increased to 209 students. In 1926, the entire teaching corps of the city of Martinsburg consisted of 65 white and 10 African-American teachers, not counting music and art instructors. Students who attended the school vividly remember and appreciate the teachers who impacted their lives. At least 42 teachers, assistant principals, and principals served the many students who received an excellent education in the Sumner and Raymer schools between the late 19th century and mid 20th century. My second grade teacher was Mrs. Estelle Rideout. She also was our Brownie troop leader, and she would take us to her home in the Pine Hills, and we would go camping there for a week. Mr. Spencer taught science. He was a band director, and that was one of my favorite classes. I learned how to play four different instruments under him. Every summer, I would go 
and learn how to play each instrument. And in science, in the evening, he would take his time and we would go over in this field up here by the railroad tracks. He, as many parents that would allow, when it got dark, we would go up there and he would have us learn how to wear the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper and all those were. And it was just a joy being in his class. Miss Queenie Williams, and she was one of the favorites. She was our music teacher also. She would do plays, she would do talent shows, she was the glee club leader, and it was just awesome the way she did those things. She taught us how to read music, and that was the part that I enjoyed with her. Her and Mr. Spencer together taught us how to read the music. And it was great. It was so good having Mrs. Wilms. Oh my, she, she would put on those plays and things. And when the Glee Club would have concerts and things, we'd have a full house here. And uh, it was always wonderful the way she would do it. And uh, I really learned how to sing and everything through Mrs. Wilms. Our school was a real good school. It really was. We had the best teachers, I felt. We had the best teachers going. And uh, they they really taught us and they told us we had to really, we really had to learn because if we didn't get it from them, we wasn't going to get it. They pushed us, you know, they were, uh, they expected things out of us that we didn't know we could even do. And um, it proved to be quite instrumental as we move forward in, in class. So it was just a wonderful place. The lunches were just delicious. I remember Miss Queenie Williams. She was my favorite teacher, and she was so much fun when she taught English. And um, I enjoyed and learned so much from her. But she didn't play around. She would, uh, if you got out of line, she'd throw an eraser. When she would teach, she'd write it on the blackboard, and she'd explain everything when we were uh, breaking down sentences and, and whatever it was. And she'd laugh and she smiled and she was so welcoming and warm that it made you want to learn. There was order in the classroom. We were able to learn. Um, if somebody was disruptive, then they went to the cloakroom. And that means there's a paddle in the cloakroom. And they would paddle you. Not, never got a paddling, thank goodness. But um, that seems cruel, but when I look at the people who graduated with me and where they are now, we've prospered. And when I look and hear some of the things the students are going through now, they don't expect anybody to tell them what to do or how to do it. And they are very rebellious. And we were taught, you got to go along to get along, so to speak. You do what is right, but you got to know when you have to stop. You can push that envelope because you won't get anywhere if you don't challenge things that's going on, but you have to have some wisdom. And certain things you just have to do. Whatever happened in school or whatever happened on the playground, people here on, we call the hill, they would call your mother or your aunt or whoever, and by the time you got home, you were in trouble. Uh, so that was our support system because we knew we were being watched by the community. But I learned here and what I learned at home, it was kind of um, my foundation. Well, I remember all of them because there was only six or seven of them, and each of them, they were highly educated uh, teachers, and I don't know why they picked that little small town to come to teach there, because they could have gone somewhere else, but they were dedicated, and they stayed in that little town, and we had some of the best teachers, I imagine, uh, in the state. One teacher was Mrs. Scott. Mrs. Scott graduated from the University of Chicago, and she was, a, she was an English teacher, and she was she was tough. We were, everybody was afraid to go to her class. Everybody dreaded 
moving up because we knew we had to go through her class. But she was just a great teacher. After I found out, after I graduated out of school, I found out that she was the best teacher because she had taught us a lot. She didn't take no foolishness. I said, you, you had to get it. She didn't give you nothing. You had to earn it. Queenie Williams was another teacher, a very outstanding teacher. And she was taught seventh and eighth grade. And she was uh, down to earth and she was very friendly and just, just a great person. You knew the teacher they had the interest in you because they would stay on you. They would get on you. They would tell you all the time that you had to be good. You had to be better than the next man in order to survive. And so they spent a lot of time with you, personal guidance, and and they would spend uh, after hours time with you. So, and especially uh, teacher Mrs. Scott, she was brilliant. I won the West Virginia State History t Contest. And because of her, I was able to attend the um, ceremonies in Charleston where they, uh, it's a big ceremony. They, you know, you're knighted um, lady or uh, knight of the, um, whatever, golden horseshoe. And because of Mrs. Chilton, I was able to go. Because I was black, um, my mother had to send me on the bus because the white students who won the contest, their parents took them. So I had to go to Charleston on the bus. And because of Mrs. Chilton, whose grandmother lived in Charleston, I was able to go there and stay with her during that ceremony, that weekend. Mrs. Chilton made that possible. As a matter of fact, I think my daughter has that golden horseshoe right as of now. Education was important for my family, you know. I had an aunt, or two aunts who had gone to college, Store College in Harpers Ferry, if you know where that was. It was an important, it was, there was never a question about where you're going to finish school or where you're going to go to college. I mean, you know, that, that's, that was just like you go to seventh grade, after seventh grade you go to eighth grade, after eighth grade you go to ninth, after 12th grade, you go to college. There was never a question about whether you did or whether you didn't. In 1937, HMS Pinafore by Gilbert and Sullivan was staged by a much admired teacher, Mrs. Queenie Taylor Williams. Under coaches Robert F. Franklin and John Williams, many athletes took to the field and the court to showcase their talents. Band director Dr. Randolph Spencer said the 45-member Raymer Band sounded like it had 100 musicians. The marching band beat 75 other schools for first place at the Falls Church Memorial Day Parade in 1955 and provided the citizens of Martinsburg three concerts each year. Then we used to go to Washington for the Cherry Blossom, which Martinsburg High School and place don't even go there now. We was in all the Apple Blossom, our band, there's a band with banners. And they would take the band and take the patrolmans. Well, we would march along, have our white thing and all, and we ate good. It was food. Patrolmans didn't have to pay for the meals. So these are the benefits of the school. So the school was great, you know? Upon Raymer's death in 1946, Robert F. Franklin became the last principal of the Sumner School. In 1947, the Sumner School was renamed the Raymer Memorial School in honor of Mr. Raymer for his 37 years as principal and the person primarily responsible for the building that still stands. The kids here went to Bursary School or Rosemont School. So when all the kids went, all the teachers went to a different school, Mr. Franklin, they was not ready for Mr. Franklin to become a principal over white kids because they could have left the school here and had the white kids come here and let him be a principal, but they wasn't ready. Even though it was integrated, but they found their ways of, of separating. We still separate. We're going to integrate, put you over here, but we don't want this black man to be the principal over these kids. So you have a situation where if you integrated th this school also, were you gonna leave that black principal in place? Where most likely families would have a problem with their child being in a school where there was a black principal? No. 
So that's why I believe that this school wasn't used in the integration, uh, integrating process. In the 1954 decision of Brown versus Board of Education, the Supreme Court declared that school segregation is unconstitutional. Ironically, a new gymnasium was completed at Raymer in 1955. Once you separated, you didn't get to see some people as much. And um, being in an all-black school, you, you did get to see your friends and you were on the same page. The best part about the all-black school is that you knew everybody. You knew your teachers, you knew the principal, because they also went to church with you. You know, I mean, they went between the three churches in this area, but uh, everybody knew everybody. All black school, you felt comfortable because you knew people. All white school was very uncomfortable. I had to walk seven blocks to school. I passed two elementary white uh, schools to get to Sumner. The John Street School was just next to my house and my mother was never able to say, tell me, explain why I had to w walk so far to go to school when there was a school just next door. That was the John Street School. And then there was another uh, elementary school, the Burke Street School, which I also passed to get to Sumner. A few students left the Raymer School to attend Martinsburg High School in 1956 before an integration plan was initiated. One was Gloria Carter, who was the first African American to graduate from Martinsburg High School in 1958. I'm a book lover. I love to read. And I wanted a library. I, that's the reason why I went to Martinsburg, was because they had a library. So when they said integration was Segregation was over, I could integrate. I decided it was time. So I called the school and asked for the principal. I got Dr. Mudge on the line and I said to him, I'm black and I wanna to come to the school. Is it okay? And he said, I can't stop you. I said, thank you. And the arrangements were made. I went to Martinsburg High. They had, they had a gym, they had a gymnasium. Um, they had different, different classes. You know, we didn't have typing. We didn't have um, anything like that here. We had a home make department. We didn't have woodworking. Um, there was just so much that was offered at Martinsburg High that was not offered here. So we were looking for a better ed education. We talked about it. Jean would come up, come up to our house, and we we had one telephone. And my mother said we were, she wasn't going to put our telephone downstairs. We put it upstairs. So she said, "You're not going to have a bunch of children running in out." using our telephone. So that was the reason she put it upstairs in their bedroom. Sometimes they locked the bedroom door so we wouldn't get on the phone. And just happens that day when Jean said, you know what, Nancy, I'm gonna call Dr. Mudge and see after the integration passed, if we can go to Martinsville High School. And Jean's the one when we were upstairs, she called Berkeley County uh, the superintendent's office, he said, I can't stop you if you want to come. It's passed. So she said, I'm going. And I said, I'm going. And then I got nervous that as the time got close and my father and mother said, sit down and talk to me and said, now do you really want to go or do you want to stay down at Raymond? I said, well, I don't want Jean to go by herself. But then we had talked Harry Busey into going we had talked Jackie Jones into going. We had talked Mary Catherine Johnson into going. So we decided we was going. And that's, that's the way it happened. Between 1960 and 1964, the Board of Education phased out the Raymer School grade by grade. The last graduating class of the school was the class of 1959. 
Mrs. Catherine Levitt Cole was the last teacher to walk the halls of Raymer School. Cole taught the final first and second grade classes. She was the lone teacher in the building on West Martin Street when it closed in 1964. In the late 1980s, the school risked being sold to cover the $2.6 million deficit the school board faced. Fortunately, the community mobilized to stop the sale. The Sumner Raymer Memorial School is now home to the Sumner Raymer Heritage Archives, a living legacy to students, parents, administrators, educators, staff, and citizens of Martinsville. Since 1990, the archives have ensured the existence of the Sumner Raymer School legacy. At first, the holdings of the Heritage Archives were placed in a display closet. Then in August of 1997, Superintendent Manny Arvon presented a letter to Leonard Harris, officially granting the archives a classroom to hold the growing collection and sealed the deal with a gentleman's handshake. To ensure this legacy, on May 19, 2014, the Board of Education leased that classroom to the Heritage Group for $1 per year for 99 years for a museum to preserve the history of the school. Leonard Harris has served as president of the Heritage Association, and his wife Helen has served in various capacities for 33 years. The Harrises have provided countless tours to school and church groups and individuals. The Sumner and Raymer schools did not have many of the resources that were provided the white schools. Despite those disadvantages, former students remember vividly that a family atmosphere and strong sense of shared community characterized the school. This community spirit existed not just because many siblings, cousins, parents, aunts, and uncles attended the school, but because the teachers were often from the students' neighborhoods and church communities. Teachers cared about the students challenged them and motivated them to excel. Many Sumner and Raymer graduates, despite economic and social disadvantages, achieved successful and distinguished careers. After segregated education of African-American students ceased, the Raymer School building became known as the Sumner Raymer Memorial School. Looking back at the history of the school, many students recall what was lost in the integration process. As children, at times, they experienced the exchange of a warm, nurturing, and familial community at Raymer for a cold, hostile, and racist struggle during the experience of integration. It was the first year of um, desegregation, and we weren't welcomed. I didn't learn anything new. They had prepared us so well. I mean, we had conjugation of a verb. We had math. It was, you know, it almost got me into algebra. So I was surprised. I just went to school and sat in the class, listened, took my test, and got A's. So it was just easy in that way. However, the taunting, name-calling, um, things like that, there were fights, there were followed home. It was just, it was really scary. <laughs> Why did they send us here? You know, we had it great. I don't understand what happened. Because, you know, when you're, well, it was almost a teenager, but still, what is going on? Why? I can never understand why. It was a very difficult time for, you know, to transfer from here into a white school. And especially when there was a white school that was closer to where we lived, but uh, that school decided, I guess they had their quota. So we didn't get into that one. That's why we ended up going to high street school. Once you separated, you didn't get to see some people as much. The challenges of integration were bumps on an otherwise absolutely positive road. In reality, much work remains and the legacy of segregation and discrimination has not been completely erased. I'm proud that I did it. I'm happy that I did it. Um, I just wish it hadn't taken so long for the people to see that the color of your skin does not make who you are. You all have a better opportunity to go to school, go to college, and you can get a better job. We can only hope that the people who hear these stories, if you can just 
Just get one or two people to open their eyes and to also tell the story, then we have succeeded. Documentaries like this are essential for carrying the story forward so that people understand and learn that, that there is a rich history. And you look around this room, this, this, this museum, this building is like a monument to so many giants in this community, in Martinsburg and Berkeley County, who worked really hard under the harshest conditions to educate their children, to raise their families, to prosper, to grow, to contribute, uh, to make this area, you know, uh, a better place. The Martinsburg Berkeley County NAACP will continue to advocate for further truth telling in our history and equality and justice for all. Thank you for taking the time to learn about a cherished school in our community.